Okay, so um, we will start with the um, second presentation in this session, uh, which will be given by um, Jesko Zimmerman from um, Ashtown Research Center. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm going to scale back a bit. This is a lot smaller problem and a lot smaller tool. Um, to start a bit, um, to give a bit of background how they came to be, uh, I'm going to just briefly talk a bit what I'm doing. I'm working for the Irish Agricultural Research Authority, CHAGASC, and I'm what's called a data technologist. I help I research support staff, I help the researchers with analyzing, acquiring, and managing data. And of course, one important part in agricultural research becoming more and more prevalent is the use of remote sensing data. So remote sensing data is yeah. One. So like this. Okay, what's happening there? Uh, did the arrow work? So. Nope. I don't know. So, so, don't. Should be images on there. Put loads of nice images on there. Not sure why they're not popping up. Um, I might be here. Uh, okay. Then I have to unfortunately talk over that. Sorry for that. There were supposed to be nice images on there just showcasing the importance of uh, remote sensing in agriculture. So remote sensing is important for land use and land use change detection especially in an environment like Ireland, where um, the average agricultural field is incredibly slow and products like uh, Kareen fail miserably in presenting the diversity of the landscape. Um, also, it is important for uh, measuring productivity. Uh, again, in Ireland, which is a very grassland-based agricultural economy, um, with a high diversity of grassland and grassland management being crucial in terms of fertilization, uh, rotation, remote sensing can help farmers massively in managing the livestock and knowing where to fertilize a paddock, where to move the cows on the next day, um, where the grass has grown too fast and may need to be topped. But it's also important in assessing impacts of extreme events. For example, last year was an extreme weather event, I think all over Europe, and Ireland suffered especially due to um, the drought causing the grass growth to fail and farmers having to import massive amounts of feed because they couldn't uh, rely on the local grass growth anymore. It is also being more and more used for disease detections. For example, crop diseases can now be detected um, from remote sensing imagery, helping farmers to respond very quickly and very targeted to crop, uh, to, to diseases. Now, a problem with that, with remote sensing, especially in a country like Ireland, is not popping up. There we go. Next one, there we go, is um, cloud detection. So this is an amazing image of Ireland for multiple reason, reasons. Um, or for, for one specific reason is that there's no cloud on it. This doesn't happen, usually. Get an image like that of Ireland, even in 2018, that was incredibly hot and incredibly dry, is the exception. Most images will look like this. So this poses a problem in remote sensing. Everyone working remote sensing knows how important multi-temporal imagery is. Land use change detection, you need multi-temporal imagery, um, but also land use detection. As I said, um, in Ireland especially, is very grassland focused, but it's uh, very different from what you may expect from other countries. Grassland in Ireland is diverse and goes from barely managed, where you just throw out a few cows in uh, February, March, leave them there until November, and that's it, to incredibly heavy managed, where you have your field divert, 
uh, cut down into many paddocks and every day the cows are moved to a different field to make sure that they get the maximum grass out of the land. So to make any sort of land use assessment on these fields, you need, or on the intensity of the grassland, you need very a high temporal resolution to detect events like cutting, like changes in the paddocks. So um, also in, in the terms of um, extreme event detection, the impact might be very short-lived. So if you have, uh, happen to only have one image in a month or so, you might not catch whatever an extreme event may have caused in terms of impact. So there are a couple of pro uh, ways to get around working with clouds, um, especially if you're like myself in a research environment with no access to um, any cloud solutions um, and you have to process things locally on, say, a local archive um, or download the imagery straight from Copernicus as you need it. So the first one is you just set a threshold for your cloud cover and only download imagery that has that meets this threshold. Advantages, um, you save a lot of space and you save time on your computer. You save space on your computer, you save time, you acquire lots of images, but it's also useful when you say you need full coverage of an area where you can say, okay, I really want only 20% cloud cover. The problem is that um, if you're only interested in specific locations, small locations spread in a large area, an image with, say, um, 80% cloud cover might still be useful because it just happened to be that your area of interest doesn't have a cloud. So it also has the disadvantage that you may still, even though you download your archive, you may still have to go through it and check manually with the cloud mask provided if the image is really useful for your own small little area. So these are just um, the distribution of different uh, cloud covers in a Sentinel-2 tile acquisition. This is a tile over the um, east of Ireland, most of the images, as you see here, as I said, most of the images are 90 to 100% cloud cover and completely useless. But if you say pick a threshold of 50%, you may lose half of the remaining images that may still be useful. Same for um, 2017, and I'd just like to show it because it was such an exceptional year. 2018, you do end up with a lot of images that are cloud free. However, as I said, it still wasn't great because uh, a lot of haze was on them. So they, um, from a spectral point of view, they may still not be useful. The other um, way to deal with that is just to manually go through the cloud masks, overlay them with your points of interests, and ex uh, extract the data manually. That is, of course, very accurate, but it also takes a lot of time and work, which you might not have. So, to turn a problem into a solution, I try to um, develop a little tool that automatically checks the cloud mask in an image, in an image archive, and extracts, at the moment, just uh, a file that tells you which of these images are useful for a set of points. The tool is completely written in open source Python packages, so it uses Rasterio for uh, cloud mask processing. It uses GeoPandas, Shapely, and Fiona for shape, um, vector processing and file reading. So far, I have included uh, two, actually, two uh, satellite platforms. One I had, but I've recently changed the tool over and um, need to reassess how I put in the cloud mask. So it works for Sentinel-2 imagery, both uh, 1C and 2A products and both in the Copernicus format and the Thea, the format Mosgate. Um, and it also works, again, this tool is kind of built from necessity from our own archives, and we have access to the uh, Venus satellite, which was launched by CNES and the Israeli Space Agency, so it works for that as well. And what it does, you give it um, a set of points or polygons, it will scan through your whole image archive and then return the list of images for each point that are cloud-free according to the product cloud mask. Um, this is just the overview. So you provide your Im satellite images as an archive or as single images, um, your areas of interest. 
you select your platform. It will look if it's compressed. If it's compressed, it will unpack the image. It will overlay your um, feature class or shapefile or whatever as a GeoPandas data frame with your satellite image. It will make sure that they're in the same projection. And then it will write, at the moment, um, it's under development, at the moment it will just return a CSV file where you have your feature ID. And for each of the feature IDs, you get the, uh, the name of the image that is cloud-free at that stage. So it's uh, currently a command line tool. This is just a help file. Um, so you just run it like any command line tool in Python. And it works fast unless you want to unpack imagery or you say your imagery is zipped, then it can take a while because it has to unpack each of the images. So I'm just going to present a little case study. So we have one research project that looks at um, assessing Lucas imagery, so Lucas um, points. Lucas is a land use and land cover survey done by the EU that covers all of Europe in a fairly high resolution grid where they sent out surveyors that go, went to the field, recorded them according to the uh, EU land use and land cover framework, um, took in pictures, and the problem is, as I said, grassland in Ireland is very diverse, but they just recorded everything as grassland that was grassland. So we wanted to break it down to a more high resolution, more suitable for Irish farmers or Irish research, grassland research. So one part of it was assess, visual assessment of uh, remote sensing imagery. And because there are so many Lucas points all over Ireland, there was no way in manually assessing each of them for cloud-free, if they're cloud-free at the points. So I ran the tool um, over that. I'm just taking one county here, County Meath. Do we have a map? Yes, so County Meath is in the east of Ireland. That's the county, you've got all points. I selected that specifically because County Meath is luckily covered by a single Sentinel-2 tile, uh, making it easier as a case study. Um, I'm using the Lucas points to identify the locations that I'm interested in, and I'm also using the Land Parcel Identification System, which is a Euro European Union administrative tool where farmers can report their land or do report their land use in order to re receive subsidies. And I just use that to delineate the actual field. So the Lucas data has just given us points. But I wanted to show here as well that you can use it on polygons as well. So in this case, the tool will exclude, once you have a bit of cloud in a polygon, it will exclude it because, say, you take your mean for the polygon, it screws up your reflectance data and might screw your machine learning algorithm. You want the whole polygon cloud-free. So these are the points, um, just some images, some examples of how Sentinel-2 images might look. And you immediately see the problem. This is, um, I'd say, 50%, over 50%, well, say around 50% cloud cover. Um, a lot of the points would be useless. But you actually do find areas where you get a useful satellite image out of there. So say you would have run your uh, just uh, extract exclusion by uh, threshold value, you would have lost some useful data there. Um, that's a great image. Again, that doesn't happen very often in Ireland. And a few other ones. Again, this image might still need a lot of manual checking to, uh, to see if it works. So just uh, for the tile, I ran. Um, I looked at the number of images if you just do an exclusion. So you say up to 90% cloud cover, you end up with 99 image. Up to 60% cloud cover, 59 image, images. 40% cloud cover, 41 image, images. Now, this is the result. You run the tool, you get a list. So each point, so you can link that straight again to your shapefile um, and the image that is cloud free for that point. And what you get is a nice overview. So this shows for 2016. This area obviously has a relatively high cloud cover, while here you get relatively low cloud cover. It's still not great. There are about, max in 2016, maximum of 29 cloud-free images. 2017, very similar. There's an upland area. That's why they are very cloudy. 
and 2018 you get a lot more, up to 59 cloud-free images. So I think it's quite a useful tool. There are some caveats, of course. Um, just to say, this only uses cloud mask. It uses the product-specific cloud mask. I haven't developed a new cloud mask here. So the output of the product is only as good as the cloud mask that goes in. And if the cloud mask is not great, if it's either over-identifying or under-identifying, um, you might lose information or have to still will still find images that will actually be cloudy, even though um, it was identified as non-cloudy. Especially uh, the Sentinel-2 Copernicus products are, um, tend to be um, under-identifying clouds. Um, it's also working, um, as I said, it's uh, working on, on compressed archives is slow. That's just because decompressing is slow. And it's also work in progress. It's kind of out of necessity. And the way it works is that when we need, say, new images, acquire a new archive, I'll add to it. But it is available on GitHub. So if you are interested, you can download it. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Um, questions? Uh, so I'm, I'm curious about the insides of the cloud cover tool. I suppose you do pixel classification, or? Yes, so um, depends, it actually depends. <laughs> it depends on the, um, on the product. Yeah. So if I use, um, I overlay it with a cloud mask. So when I use Sentinel-1 uh, ESA imagery, they, the cloud mask is provided as a GML file. So I produce a cloud mask from that and then do pixel overlay. Um, if they're, for example, Muscate pro products, the cloud mask comes as a, um, I think it's a bit encoded file. It's a raster, so that's a bit easier. At the moment, for I use the highest threshold in the code. So say if it's a bit encoded file, if the bit is more than zero, then I say it's cloud and exclude it. But that can actually, because it's, the source code can be accessed, so you can change around how sensitive you want the cloud mask to be, or how sensitive you want the um, cloud mask to be interpreted. So if you want to say, if you want to still include uh, Cirrus um, or Cloud Shadow, you can do that. Okay. So, uh, so the pictures come with a cloud mask? Yes, so they are they're specifically for products that have cloud masks um, in them. So Sentinel 1, 2, now 1 doesn't have cloud masks, it doesn't have clouds. Uh, Sentinel 2, uh, Landsat 8 products, um, Venus products, they all come with a cloud mask provided. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, more of an observation than a question. Mm -hmm. So, um, a few years ago I worked on a, a huge archive of imagery that uh, in which we had to look for uh, cloud-free images for a certain area. Mm -hmm. What we did was to uh, extract uh, a, a multi-polygon of the cloud-free areas, so mm -hmm. vectorize it, yeah. simplify it s mm, yeah. a, a quite a bit because otherwise it would have been huge, and then stick it into PostGIS, and then we were using that as a primary filter. And that was extracting, that, that was giving us a small sub subset of the images that we would then check against their cloud mask precisely, and it was a lot faster. Okay, the, I find that apart from the un unzipping, the, the the packages actually are very fast at reading. Um, what I want to do in the future is actually for those area have pixel extraction straight away so that you get, for example, average uh, reflectance value in a polygon. So I'll, I'll keep that in mind, actually. It's an interesting solution. Thank you. OK, so I have one question. So clouds is a major problem, uh, but also cloud, sh cloud, sh yes. cloud shadows is also a problem. Yeah. Are you familiar with any good method to remove cloud shadows? Um, no. Is, uh, the thing is, I'm, when, for example, I do, uh, at the moment, when I do level two processing, I use the Maya algorithm, which does provide a cloud shadow mask as well, and then I am using the filter 
to exclude those as well straight away. You can, with, as I said, when you access the source, the source code, you can tweak the, the bits, the bit detection to either include or exclude um, the cloud, um, either cloud shadow or um, series and so on. But no, I don't. Yeah, I, I don't know either. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. So thank you, and we'll take a break, and you can switch rooms. Thank you.